Uh, my name is Adam Sud. Uh, I'm a nutrition uh, insulin resistance expert. I'm also an expert in addiction and behavior change. Um, and uh, I um, had quite a journey myself. I, as it showed here, I've, I've lost 200 pounds. I'm a suicide survivor. Um, I'm actually now 11 years sober, which I'm really excited uh, to continue that journey. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm just going to share with you all my story. And my story starts here. This is a really catchy title. Okay. That's all it is. Plant-based addict journey from pills to plants, get people in the room. But that's really not what this story is about. The story is about a journey from shame to love and acceptance. From being in a place where life doesn't feel like a safe, secure, or hopeful place to be present to a place where life has become an exciting place to show up. And I think what you're going to do as you listen to this is you might hear parts of yourself. And I'm confident that you will certainly hear not only parts of yourself, but perhaps parts of someone that you love. And the reason for that is I am not special. There is nothing uniquely different about me that moved me into this story that is not seen in other people. Uh, I hope that at the end of this, you will have a new perspective on what depression, anxiety, addiction, and the human journey actually is. Because we do have a story. We have a very pervasive story about what these things are, about what addiction, about what anxiety, what, what depression, what those things are. But when you observe it in the real world, what you are very easily going to notice is that what you observe is not the story that you're told. And I think that's a problem. I think that's a problem because most of the programming that we have in order to help people who are struggling with depression, anxiety, and, and addiction are designed to meet the needs of the story and not what's actually taking place. So let me just start at the beginning. This is this is my family. I'm, I'm a seventh generation Texan. I'm also a Jew. Uh, so I grew up eating burgers and barbecue and bagels and blintzes. I grew up a sports fan. That's my dad in the middle. Uh, obviously, that's my mom on the right. I'm actually the one on the left side of the screen. The one on the right is my identical twin brother, Bobby, and that's my little sister, Jewel. And I had a phenomenal childhood. I grew up privileged. Um, I had the opportunity to go to a safe school where I could ride my bike to and from school with my friends. But my life didn't always feel like a safe place to be. And that is because with all the love and care in the world my parents had, my parents were exceedingly hypercritical. Um, my dad would make comments about my body. My dad would make comments about the way that I ate. My dad would make comments about the way that I didn't eat. My dad would make comments about the way that I dressed, the way that I acted, to the point to where I began to believe that there were unreasonable and unmeetable conditions upon which I could be acceptable to myself and other people. And this began to worry me by the time I was age 10 because I kept waking up every single day and finding out that no matter what I did, it was always worthy of criticism. And it made me afraid to show up and be myself. I started to act out. My parents took me to a doctor that prescribed me, that diagnosed me with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And essentially, I had a now an authority figure, a person in a white coat, who was saying to me, Adam, guess what? I've identified something about you that isn't that, that doesn't work right. That is that's unacceptable. And in fact, it's something that no one wants to see about you. And we're going to medicate you for this. And as long as you take this medicine, it's called Ritalin, you know, nothing, you know, no one's ever going to know you have this problem. And that's how you should do life. You should, you should meet the demands of, the other, of, of others, even if it means compromising who you are. Now, that's not exactly what the doctor said, but that is what I heard. We moved from Austin, Tex from Houston, Texas to Austin, Texas, right before I started high school. And this was about mid nineties. And I'm gonna tell you, uh, uh, I experienced unbelievably intense bullying. Um, the, the advocacy around bullying then isn't what it is today. And physical bullying, emotional bullying, verbal bullying, so bad that about halfway through my freshman year of high school, when my parents would drop me off at school, the assistant principals would have to get their eyes on me and make sure that I made it into the school safely. 
Now, at about this time, my prescription from Ritalin had been changed to a new medication called Adderall. I'm sure most of you have, have heard of this medication. It's, a, it's simply another stimulant-based medication used to treat ADHD. And I had to take two doses, one in the morning and one in school. And I remember taking my second dose in the middle of class. And as I was walking out of class, I always went right because if I went left, well, then I would go past some people that were constantly causing me harm. As I walk out of the door, I get this arm around my neck and it yanks me over to the side. And I'm thinking, oh, here we go. But this was a little bit different. And it was interesting because it was one of the bullies who would constantly give me a very, very difficult time. He said, Adam, you know what? I want you to know the bullying's over. We, we've called it off. You know, you're new, you're a freshman. You got to understand that's how it works. And in fact, we want to make it up to you. We want to invite you to a party. It's this weekend, bring your Adderall. Now look, I, I may have been awkward, certainly. Um, I, I may have been a nerd, sure, but I wasn't stupid. And I knew exactly what was taking place. I, I knew what was happening. And I'm gonna tell you how I felt, relieved. I was relieved because it seems like I may have figured out a way to be just a little bit safer, have my life not be so difficult and so painful. And it was really attractive. And I went to the party and I brought the Adderall with me. I gave it to everybody. And that, that was the first night I actually used Adderall as a recreational drug. And I'm gonna tell you the second that that medication took effect, boom, I was absolutely hooked. Not to the substance, but to what it was able to do for me with ease and repeatability. I was an overweight freshman and Adderall is amphetamine. That's what the stuff is. And I'm not saying that because I'm either pro or anti-medicine. I'm just saying that to be accurate. So all of a sudden my energy goes through the roof. I don't, I don't ever want to eat. I have unbelievable confidence for the first time ever. These are really, really amazing things. These are the kinds of feelings I've been looking for in the world and hadn't been able to find. And here I've just been able to gain all of those things just by popping a pill. How attractive. People wanted me around for the first time. And in fact, me being around them gave them the opportunity to have a better time. I know it wasn't real. I know they didn't actually want me around, but it looked enough like it that I was attracted to it. I had the ability to talk to people. I had the ability to have fun at a party. I wasn't getting beaten up. And I noticed as the weeks went on and I was continuing to use this, that all of a sudden my dad started to treat me differently. I had, I was starting to lose a little bit of weight. I was studying in a way that made my dad proud. So what an amazing thing. I, I'm not getting beat up at school. It looks like I have friends. I'm able to lose the weight. My dad is proud of me. That's incredibly attractive. And what I want everyone to understand is that if you were me and your life was mine, this is what it would feel like. You would wake up into a body that you were convinced and told is not a safe, secure, or hopeful place to be. You'd find yourself in front of parents who were amazing, but not always, didn't always feel like a safe, secure, and hopeful place to be. You'd go to school and certainly wasn't a physically, emotionally, or socially a safe, secure, or hopeful place to be. And you always had the sense that tomorrow was going to be equally, if not more difficult. Now that kind of living experience is what should create signals of depression and anxiety. Depression is a form of grief for your life not being as it should. And anxiety is a sense that tomorrow doesn't make sense to you and is not a safe place that you'd like to be present. And if that were your life and you were to use and you were to be relieved of that burden, what you would notice is that that use looked and felt exactly like self-care. And that's what addiction is. Addiction is misguided self-care. And I bonded with it. I created a loving and meaningful connection with this behavior that seemed to make life feel like I thought life was supposed to feel and it worked for me. I lost the weight. I had friends. I had girlfriends. I got a scholarship to college that I wanted to go to. Everything was working until it wasn't. In college, the typical addiction story took place. It got overwhelming. I had to drop out of school. I moved home, started to engage in criminal drug behavior. I was doctor shopping. It's where you have multiple doctors prescribing the same medications without them knowing about it. I was 14 prescriptions, which is a felony. I was buying and selling drugs on the street. I was treating my family like absolute 
garbage. I was going through so much drugs so quickly that there would be two weeks where I didn't have any. And so I found that fast food was an amazing substitute for me to just not have to experience life. Just eat so much that I could just numb myself up, make it through two weeks, then get more drugs. There's a quote that nothing records the effects of a sad life so graphically as the human body. This was me at just about 300 pounds in this photos. I'm gonna tell you every single day I would get up and I would go to a place called Torchy's Tacos. I get three potato, egg and cheese breakfast tacos. Then I go straight to McDonald's and get two supersized double quarter pounder meals. Then I go to Whataburger, get the extra large honey barbecue chicken strip sandwich meal. For dinner, I get an extra large pizza from Papa John's. Then I go back at three in the morning to Whataburger for three of the breakfast on a bun sandwiches with sausage. And I drink about 15 sodas a day. And when I say I was struggling with substance use disorder, the average prescription for Adderall is about 10 milligrams for every 24 hours. And I was doing a minimum of 450 milligrams every 24 hours, some days upwards of a thousand. I would do it for six days straight. I wouldn't sleep, I wouldn't eat. And I would end up in the beginning stages of a drug-induced psychosis where I would pop copious amounts of opiates that I could calm myself down, go to sleep, wake up and start that whole cycle over again. Life was becoming a miserable place and I didn't understand what was happening. I couldn't understand how what was once the greatest solution in my life was becoming the most difficult problem I'd ever faced. And you couldn't convince me that it was the problem because you don't know how hard my life was when I didn't have it. And you don't know how successful it felt once I found it. So don't tell me that this stuff didn't work. I know it'll work. I just have to figure it out again because I don't like life without it. I remember that. I remember how bad it was. I can't go back there. And I was, I was arguing with my parents. I was fighting with my parents. I was, they were trying to help me. They constantly wanted me to, to talk to them about it. I just wanted to treat them like garbage and ask them for money and leave. But my dad, who believed me, I had given my parents every reason in the world to give up on me. My dad, uh, who is uh, one of the original founding investors of Whole Foods Market, uh, he came to me with an opportunity. Whole Foods Market had partnered with a man named Rip Esselstyn, who created this thing called the Engine 2 Plant Strong Immersion. It was essentially a seven-day retreat where you learn how to adopt something called a plant-based diet. Uh, this was something that they were offering to all of their team members at Whole Foods and now, I wasn't working for Whole Foods, but my dad he came to me and said, there's a few spots open. Adam, all, all I want you to do is go. I think you're going to find out that if you can change one part of your life, it'll inspire you to be passionate about other parts of your life. And I'm going to tell you what, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to know what a plant-based diet was. I didn't know who Rip Esselstyn was. I sure shit didn't want to know who he was. All I did know was that, man, if I could just convince my dad that I really was interested in this thing, I bet it would be more money. Yeah. That's exactly what I did. I, I went to him and lied and said, oh yeah, dad, this is great. I, I actually went and I got his book. I started reading, it seems really great. And I wish I could tell you that after I went to this thing, that this all made sense, that uh, I listened to all these luminary thought leaders and physicians talk about how you can reverse disease and and how I was inspired to do it. But it just isn't my story. Even though it did make sense, even though it did seem like, wow, they really, this thing could really work for me. I'll tell you why I left and kept doing what I was doing. For a very simple reason. I simply wasn't willing to give up what was allowing me to escape a life that was too painful a place to be on the gamble that this plant-based diet thing might work out for me in a year. It was too scary a thing. And so I left and my life got worse. By the time I was 30 years old, I weighed 350 pounds. I had undiagnosed diabetes, high cholesterol, high blood pressure. I had erectile dysfunction for reasons I didn't understand. I had infected cuts on my legs that wouldn't heal for reasons I didn't understand. And living hurt in every sense of the word, physically, spiritually, emotionally, I was two weeks away from being homeless. I'd blown everything that I ever had, everything I was gonna inherit. And I had been battling suicidal thoughts for six months. Now, I didn't have a plan. I didn't write a note. 
But on August 21st of 2012, in this apartment, I tried to end my life by, uh, by overdose. I grabbed a handful of pills, I threw them down my throat. And I was sitting on the couch in my living room, in this living room. And overdoses aren't something I was new to experiencing. I've been abusing drugs for over 10 years, but this one felt distinctly different. I can remember trying to stand up off of the couch. And as I did, it felt like I got stabbed in the right side with a hot knife. My entire right side of my body cramped. I buckled over and I can see my vision going black very, very fast. And I'm gonna tell you the feeling that I had in that moment. And I'm not talking about the physical description that I just laid out for you. I'm talking about the feeling that I had that I was experiencing the last second of my life, completely separate from everything and everyone that ever meant anything to me. Not because they didn't wanna be there for me, but because I made it impossible for them. That was the most terrifying experience I've ever had. I woke up a few hours later in a puddle of vomit in that pile of fast food garbage. And I was overwhelmed with immense relief. And I found that to be a little confusing because I honestly believed that what I had just attempted to do is I thought I was trying to end my life. But that relief that I felt, well, that can only be possible if there's something about myself and my life that I loved enough. Something about myself and my life that was so meaningful, so important that even though this was going to be the most difficult day I'd ever had. I was relieved to still be a part of it. I'm going to tell you that was my rock bottom moment and rock bottom. It's hard, but man, is it a beautiful place. It's beautiful because it will present to you front and center the reality that if you don't go this way instead of that way now, it's all over and not just the hard parts, not just the parts you dislike, not just the parts that are painful, all of it, all of the things that you love, all of the things that are important, all of the potential down the road that you haven't seen yet. Now, I don't know if we get around to, I don't know if we move on from this life and we go to a higher plane of consciousness and we get to continue on in our story. I don't know if we get to come back, but what I'm very certain of is that we all get to experience this world as the individuals that we are now once. And I saw that being taken from me. And I grabbed a hold of the phone and I called my parents and I said three words, I need help. And they didn't judge. They didn't question me. All the things I'd been so afraid of hearing that we told you so, or I don't know why it took you so long, or you know what, Adam, it's enough, enough. All they said to me was, Adam, we love you. We love you whether you're using or you're not. We love you and all we want to do is help. We don't know how, but what we'd like for you to do is just come be with us, fit with us. Let us take care of this with you. I'm going to tell you that's maybe the most important thing I've ever been told in my entire life. For people who are struggling, we don't want we don't want solutions to our problems as much as we want to be reminded that we have not been forgotten by the people who matter the most to us. We want to be reminded that there's a place among our community of shared respect that is being saved for us and will always be there. It's always ours. And that we are not just what we struggle with. We are a meaningful part of the goings on of what makes life meaningful for the people that matter the most to us. And I packed my bags and went over to my parents' house and they helped me check into, a, into treatment. I can remember walking into those doors. That was a terrifying experience. I, right at the, when you walk in at the end, there's this big sign above these double doors in the, the hallway. It says MAS, which is medically assisted um, uh, supervised withdrawal. It's essentially the detox thing. Now, I've never been in detox, but oh my goodness, had I heard stories and I was very afraid. 
doors open. The nurse comes walking down the hall. She's got her eyes on me. I know she's coming to get me. I'm holding my, my mom's hand. My dad's got his arm around my shoulder. And she takes my hand and she very kindly, very gently asked me if I was ready to go. And I couldn't even speak. And so she guides me away from my parents. And I know, I don't know what's about to happen, but I know it's going to be very, very difficult. And I'm very afraid. I'm very, very scared. I look back behind me, my mom's crying. My dad has his arms around my mom and, and I notice my dad is crying. And I'd only ever seen my dad cry twice in my life. That day and the day that his mom died in an accident. I checked in and I spent the next 24 hours uh, going through a whole host of psychological evaluations, biomedical testing. I had to stand naked in, in, a, in a doctor's office, do a whole physical examination nurses and doctors that was a very embarrassing it felt very felt like a criminal it was very dehumanizing certainly for someone like myself who had been in the belief that my body was just this horrible thing all i wanted to do was was hated enough to to finally want to change something but man this was this was my worst nightmare but it was important i didn't know it then but what they were doing is they were caring for me the reason why they do it is number one, they want to know how are you emotionally, psychologically, what's going on with you? They want to care for you. The reason why they strip search you and search your things is because listen, most people who check into treatment are not sober when they check in. I used before I went. And this is a very extraordinary effort that we're about to undertake. It's a scary thing. And so it makes sense that people who are abusing substances, whose substances mean the world to them, that they might try to bring something in. It's not, we're not thinking about trying to harm anybody or, or put anybody at risk, but you have to understand how safe these substances make us feel. So they wanna make sure that you're not doing that. You wanna make sure that because people who are living uh, lives of substance use disorder also engage in behaviors that could put other parts of their health, health at risk. So they wanna make sure that, are you okay? I got a note from the doctor. I needed to go see him after about 72 hours. I walk into the doctor's office sitting across from him and he tells me that I have a uh, very advanced type two diabetes. My fasting blood sugar was 400. I had an A1C of 12. My cholesterol was over 300. My uh, blood pressure was 210 over 130. My resting heart rate was 115. Diagnosed me with obsessive compulsive personality disorder, suicidal depression, anxiety disorder, sleep disorder, attention deficit disorder. Put me on a whole host of medications, and, and I, I, would, I can remember this very clearly. I'm sitting across from the doctor, and he says to me, Adam, listen, here's the reality. You have heart disease and diabetes, and you always will. It's so advanced, you're likely, there's a very high risk that you could have a heart attack in the next five to 10 years. There's a very real chance that you could lose your vision or your hearing or potentially limbs due to your diabetes. Your, your class three obesity, you're likely always going to be overweight, according to the data. You're gonna be on these medications that have very real side effects. You're gonna be on them for life. But Adam, if you, want, if you want your life to get better, you've gotta stop using drugs. I thought to myself, oh, what a horrible thing to say. I mean, he literally just painted a picture of a future that I had no interest in being a part of. What urgency now do I have to care about changing anything in my life? If no matter what I do, that's where I'm headed. I remember thinking this, this cannot be how you get sober. This cannot be the path to recovery. I didn't have any authority to think differently then, but it just rubbed me the wrong way. And I thought to myself, Man, if you know what, if I really want to do this thing, what I should really be focused on is if, what if I could be the architect of a life that felt like an exciting place to be present? What if I could reverse engineer aliveness? What if I could reorganize my environment, my priorities and my values so much that just by living in that environment over the course of time, my life becomes a safe, secure and hopeful place to be. If I do that, maybe then the use would be no longer necessary. I kept getting these like flashbacks to that seven day retreat the plant strong retreat. They kept saying, oh, you can reverse heart disease, you can reverse diabetes, it helps you lose weight. I'm like, oh, I'm just getting these messages over and over and over again. I'm like, you know what? I don't know anything about addiction, depression, anxiety, sleep disorder, but man, you know what I'm really good at? I'm really good at putting food on a plate. What if I just did that crazy thing that that guy Rip Esselstyn said to do? What if I just built an environment that looked exactly like that and lived there long enough 
and I could see what happens. Well, I wasn't allowed to change my diet and rehab. They weren't allowed, wouldn't allow me to do that. But I moved into a sober living facility in Santa Monica after 37 days. And I walk in and the way that it works is you're there with about 12 working with people. And we're all on the same you know, journey here. We're all trying to get sober. We're all trying to figure this thing out. We're all motivated and inspired. And in this sober living house, uh, the way it works is you walk up to the house manager and you, you write a list of foods that you want. They send a driver out and they buy the foods and they stock the kitchen for you. There's like 13 people. So there's a walk. I'm like, oh, there must be some healthy things in here. This kitchen literally looked like it was stocked by people who've been watching nothing but Nickelodeon commercials from the 90s. I mean, it was like Eggo waffles and pizza rolls and you know fruit roll-ups. It was terrible. I was like, I got to do this plant-based diet thing. So I walked up to the house manager whose last name is actually Hamburger. And I told him, I said, Bill, I want to do a plant-based diet. He says, Adam, great. What, do you, what is that? What is that? I said, you know, I'm not really sure myself, but here's a list of foods. It was about five items deep because all I could do was try to remember what they served. And the only greens I ate before that was the occasional piece of lettuce they didn't take off my burger at McDonald's. And I remember there was oatmeal every morning. There was rice and bean bowls. There was a lot of fruit. And so I literally said, I wrote a list, oatmeal, rice, beans, frozen veggies, fruit. That was it. He said, are you sure? I said, yeah, just give me enough for the week. Wake up the next morning. I'm crazy, crazy inspired. I can't wait to do this thing. I walk up to the pantry, I open it up, and there's the oatmeal that I asked for, and they put it right next to a box of Fruity Pebbles, which is, without question, the greatest cereal ever invented, period, end of story. This is not up for debate, because it's not a debate. Fruity Pebbles is the best cereal of all time. And I don't know what happened, but I had this overwhelming, like, visceral, visceral response. I, like, threw a fit. I threw a towel at a house manager. I stormed out of the kitchen. I started walking down Santa Monica Boulevard. I didn't know where I was going. The assistant house manager, a guy named Luke Chittick, comes running after me, grabs me. He goes, Adam, what happened? I said, what are you talking about? He goes, let me just tell you what we all saw. We saw you walk into the kitchen, open the pantry, and then start throwing things, yelling stuff, and ran out of the house. What happened? And that question, what happened? really got me thinking because I don't know. I knew what I wanted to do. I had this, the things to do it. So why in the world could this whole thing not simply be a matter of intellect and will? Why could I not just know what to do, want to do it, and then end the story? What, what was going on that made it so difficult? And I walked back into the house and I remembered there was a, uh, uh, an evolutionary psychologist named Doug Lyle who was at the retreat. And he gave a talk um, based on his book called The Pleasure Trap. And the Pleasure Trap is essentially helping you understand the biological and psychological mechanisms that compel behavior, that we have an internal guidance system that helps us figure out what's the right move to make in a very specific environment, an environment that is representative of our natural history and our natural behavior. But when you shift that environment too far away from what is representative of our natural history and natural behavior, our internal guidance system can be fooled into believing you're doing very, very good things when in fact you're self-destructive. That internal guidance system is dopamine. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter that gives us the excited euphoria that we call pleasure, but it's more unique than that. It's reward pleasure. The pleasure that we get from dopamine is a signal to the psychology of the organism that says you've just statistically increased your likelihood of survival. That's what dopamine does. And environments of scarcity, competition, and danger, the natural environment, a psychology that likes the biggest bang for its buck always wins. But in environments of abundance, in environments of ease, and in environments of extreme repeatability and convenience, that psychology can be fooled into thinking that really, really destructive behaviors must be the right thing to do because they trigger huge amounts of dopamine. Essentially, what I realized is that the reason why I walked into that kitchen and knew what I wanted to do, but was emotionally compelled to do something else, isn't because I was weak. It wasn't because I didn't have willpower or discipline. It was because that is the appropriate response my psychology should be having to an environment gone terribly wrong. And that if I wanted to reset my dopamine receptor, if I wanted to solve this problem, I could do it. But I had to do one thing. I had to be comfortable being uncomfortable. Because if I could do this long enough, my dopamine receptors would regain sensitivity and they recalibrate back to what they should be attracted to, which is a mostly whole food natural diet. 
So I had to live in an environment that looked like a whole food natural diet long enough. And if I did that long enough, it wouldn't be a chore. And if I did it just a little bit longer, I would get up and I would be excited and compelled to live there. It would make sense to my psychology. And that's what I wanted to find out. Could I do that? So why would I be willing to do it? Everyone talked about what's your why? And I'm going to tell you from the outside looking in, anybody would obviously say, oh, I know why. It's because he's 350 pounds. He nearly died from substance abuse. He has diabetes, heart disease, erectile dysfunction. Well, that's got to be why. Well, while it's true, every single one of those things was occurring, none of them were my motivation. Bye, Chris. And that is because I don't believe anybody. I'm doing well. How are you? By negative consequences. Yeah, sorry, Todd. Uh, what people are motivated I, by I already is what negative consequences no. can take from Why? Me. What's that? Um, hang on. There's somebody. I can hear someone talking in the background. Yeah, is me too. Uh, Casey, I, mute, I muted them. Thank Keep you. Okay. No one is motivated by negative consequences. What negative consequences do is they let you know that there's something meaningful and important in your life that is being threatened. Something that if threatened enough, you would fight like hell to keep. Whatever those loving and meaningful bonds in your life are, that's why you do what you do. That's why you learn new things. That's why you learn to do what you already do better. That's your motivation. Fear, negative consequences, they're great for motivating the, the need to look at your environment, to look at your life. But love is the greatest catalyst for long-term change. Essentially, I wanted to focus less on what was the matter with me and more on what matters to me. I wanted to get up and I wanted to build an environment that was encouraging the changes I wanted to see rather than try to outcompete my current environment in the hopes that I could be so disciplined and so willful and so like strong that I could do this for the rest of my life. Because that is an impossible task. Discipline, willpower, grit, determination, these are finite resources. You've only got a little bit of it per week. So if you're relying solely on your willpower to be successful, you're going to find yourself drawn back to old behaviors more often than you want because those old behaviors are there because the environment that you have encourages them. I had to learn this story. What if my body has never given up on me? Because I'm going to tell you, I did not believe this. I never believed that. I thought my body was my adversary. I've been taught that since I was a little kid. My body's my adversary. It's against me. The only way I'm going to be successful in life is if I can get up every single day and through restriction and overexertion, punish my body, and punish myself so that I could see change that I wanted to see. But I was having a conversation with my house manager and he asked me about what it was like to survive suicide. He said, why do you want to survive? I said, I don't know. I guess my body didn't want me to die. And oh, so almost as soon as I heard, as soon as my ears heard myself say that, it was, it was like I had the ability to rewrite this entire nonsense story that I had been convinced was true my entire life. Oh my gosh. What if the only reason I made it through over 10 years of substance abuse and trying and the attempt on my life, what if the only reason I survived is because my body has never given up on me? What if my body has been fighting for me since the day I was born? What if my body is my greatest ally? Well, if that's true, I shouldn't restrict a darn thing. What I wanna do is occupy the role of a caretaker. I wanna know exactly what to give my body so that it can do what it's wanted to do and has been doing my entire life, which is keeping me alive and wanting me to thrive. What if I can build an environment that gives my body the opportunity to demonstrate unbelievable potential? That's what I wanted to do. Now, everyone says you need to have a plan. And I agree, you should have a plan. But I think more so than that, what you need to do is you need to get very, very clear about what you want your life to look like. What are the behaviors that you do? How do you engage with people? Who are the people that you engage with? And once you've done that, you need to make your environment look like those goals. If you do this, your statistical likelihood of success goes through the roof. And the reason for that is your habits and behaviors are a function of your personality and the environment that you find yourself in. 
Now you can do one thing, one or two things. You can try to change your personality. I'm not saying that's impossible. It's a very difficult task. Or you can change your environment today. Your environment should be the thing that is encouraging the behavior change rather than solely your desire and determination. There's a phenomenal researcher named Dan Buettner. He's the creator of the Blue Zones. Maybe you watch his Netflix series, Living to 100. This is what he says. Nothing will influence your health and behavior more than your environment. More so than depending on self-control and willpower, create a more disciplined environment. This last one is important. Your self-control will always be better when your environment doesn't require you to depend on it. Well, after four months of living in a very specific, appropriate environment, conducive to creating the changes that I wanted, I completely reversed my diabetes, my heart disease, and my erectile dysfunction. By 10 months, I had lost over 150 pounds and within a year, I was off of every single medication I was put on rehab. The antidepressants, the mood stabilizers, the sleeping medications, the anxiety medications, the ADHD medications, everything. I completely reorganized how I moved through the world by changing and reorganizing the environment that I woke up into. I noticed life had become an exciting place to be present. I noticed I had things that I wanted to show up and work for. I noticed something really, really powerful happened. When I started my journey, if I was to look out five years, I saw that future that that doctor had told me. It was anxious, it made me anxious, it made me afraid, and it made me depressed. It made me angry a lot of the time. But about four or five months after I'd reversed the diseases, I looked out in the future in five years and the trajectory had shifted quite a bit. I saw a future where my body was a safe, secure, and hopeful place to be. I saw a social environment that was a safe, secure, and hopeful place to be. I saw the potential for a life that I wanted to be a part of, and I had gained the self-esteem and resilience to work for it every single day. Now, I know it sounds like I did this whole thing on my own, and it's just complete nonsense if you believe that. I'm going to tell you Addiction, depression, anxiety, those things thrive in isolation. In fact, they require it. But they all get their asses kicked by community. And I'm successful today because of the community that I had that never gave up on me. Rip Esselstyn, uh, he's a mentor to me. And when I met him, everything I did was about putting substances into my body to escape life. I was in survival mode. Survival mode sucks. The things Rip taught me helped me learn how to stop surviving my life and start living my life. And man, when you get to live your life, life is a wonderful thing. And then there's my uh, my mom and my dad. Um, uh, believe me, they are um, heroes. Um, I could say a thousand wonderful things about them and it wouldn't be enough. But I have two photos that I think can demonstrate it very well. This photo was taken by my mom as she and my dad were walking me into the doors of rehab. And this photo was taken by my mom as she watched my dad and I run the race in Austin three years later. And this is because they walked the entire journey with me. They never gave up on me. They gave me permission to get it wrong and figure it out in my own time. That's a privilege. They held a place for me to come home to. That's a privilege. They loved me no matter what. And that's a privilege. And I recognize that my recovery sits on a pedestal of privilege. There's a remarkable thing that can happen when you take charge of the environment that you find yourself in, when you reorganize your priorities and your values, and you decide that for nothing or no one will I stop until I see what's possible. Stuff like this, while yes, I'm very proud of this, this is not remarkable change. I mean, believe me, I'm, I'm proud of what I've been able to do physically, but let me tell you something. The hero in this picture is not the guy on the right. When he gets up every single day, he's very confident. He's confident around people. He's confident in the gym. He's confident at work. Everything is exciting, and he wants to be a part of it. The guy on the left, everything hurt every single day. He was terrified. He was alone, and he did it anyways. The reason why the guy on the right exists is because the guy on the left never gave up. The guy on the left is the strongest I'll ever be. I could put up a quote like the most profound change of your life can happen when you make the right change in your environment, but this is just clickbait.
Let me show you what profound change actually is. This is profound change. Knowing that there are people in my life who when I wake up, they wanna know what's going on with me. I call them, they answer the phone. I wanna know what's going on with them. I wanna be a meaningful part of the goings on of their world. And they wanna be a meaningful part of the goings on of mine. This is what real change looks like. Real change is, I got to meet this incredible doctor. Her name is Dr. Laura Gu. She's an amazing naturopathic physician. Uh, her specialty is in um, gut health, hormone health, and neuroatypical brains. Um, had a phone call with her back in May of 2020. It was one of the most incredible conversations ever. I also think she's incredibly beautiful, and I could look at this photo every single day, but I don't have to because I married her a year ago. You want to know what real profound change is? Spending the majority of your life believing that there was nothing about yourself worth loving, nothing about yourself that anyone else should love. So waking up one day in the presence of the most brilliant, beautiful, and incredible human you've ever met and having her say, I love you so much that I want to partner my life with you. That's profound change. And I cannot believe I almost ended my life right before the best part ever began. I wanna talk about addiction really quickly. We need to stop asking the question, why won't they stop? We need to start asking the question, why does their use make sense? This is a much more valuable question to ask. If they can answer, why does their use make sense? Then we have a real chance to reorganize their life so that they can change their life. Substance use, while it may seem crazy to those who witness it, to that person who's living with it, it feels like salvation. It makes sense to them. And if you were them, it would make sense to you too. What this means is that addiction is not an indication of biology and psychology gone wrong. It's actually a very reasonable biological and psychological response to environments socially, physically, and emotionally gone terribly wrong. They make sense every single time. And since they make sense, recovery cannot be found in the singular pursuit of abstinence, but rather in the intentional and appropriate reconnection to a life that feels so safe, so secure, and so hopeful that use is no longer necessary. For anyone here who knows someone who's struggling, I wanna give you some advice. If you love someone, you don't need to have answers. You don't need to know what to say. More than answers to our struggles, we just want to know that we're not alone in this world. We want to know that someone will sit with us when sitting with ourselves is too painful. If you know them, call them and tell them that you love them. You love them no matter what. And if they ever need any help, you may not know what to do, but you love them and you'll support them. Thank you all for letting me share my story with you. This is my website, adamsud.com. You can follow me here on Instagram, plant-based addict. And uh, thank you.